The court meets today pursuant to Article 58 of the statute to deliver its judgment in the case concerning the Jada case, India versus Pakistan. Judges Benuna, Donahue, and Crawford, who duly participated in both the deliberation and the final vote, are, for reasons explained to me, unable to take their seats on the bench today. These proceedings were instituted on 8 May 2017 by the filing in the registry of an application by the Republic of India against the Islamic Republic of Pakistan alleging violations of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan alleging violation for April 1963 to which I will refer as the Vienna Convention. According to the application of India, and I quote, in the matter of the detention and trial of an Indian national, Mr. Kulbushan Sudhir Yadav, end of quote, accused of performing acts of espionage and terrorism on behalf of India and sentenced to death by a military court in Pakistan in April, in April 2017. As is usual, I shall not read the introductory paragraphs of the judgment, which set out the procedural history of the case and reproduce the submissions of the parties. Nor shall I read the paragraphs which describe the factual background to the case. I shall also omit or summarize some paragraphs of the judgment. The full text of the judgment will, of course, be available at the close of the city. I shall accordingly begin reading of the judgment at paragraph 33. With regard to jurisdiction, India seeks to found the court's jurisdiction on Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the statute and on Article 1 of the optional protocol to the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations concerning the compulsory settlement of disputes, to which I will refer as the optional protocol. India and Pakistan have been parties to the Vienna Convention since 28 December 1977 and 14 May 1969, respectively. They also were, at the time of the filing of the application, parties to the optional protocol without any reservations or declarations. The court notes that Pakistan has not contested that the dispute related to the interpretation and application of the Vienna Convention and that the present dispute concerns the question of consular assistance with regard to the arrest, detention, trial and sentencing of Mr. Jadab. The court also notes that in its application, written pleadings and final submissions, India asks the court to declare that Pakistan has violated Mr. Jadavi's, and I quote, elementary human rights, which, were, which are also to be given effect as mandated under Article 14 of the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, end of quote. The Covenant entered into force for India on 10 July 1979 and for Pakistan on 23 September 2010. In this respect, the Court observes 
that its jurisdiction in the present case arises from Article 1 of the Optional Protocol and therefore does not extend to the determination of breaches of international law obligations other than those under the Vienna Convention. This conclusion does not preclude the Court from taking into account other obligations under international law in so far as they are relevant to the interpretation of the Vienna Convention. In light of the foregoing, the Court finds that it has jurisdiction under Article 1 of the Optional Protocol to entertain India's claims based on alleged violations of the Vienna Convention. The Court now turns to admissibility of the, to the admissibility of the application. Pakistan has raised three objections to the admissibility of India's application. These objections are based on India's alleged abuse of process, abuse of rights, and unlawful conduct. The Court addresses each of these objections in turn. In its first objection to the admissibility of India's application, Pakistan asks the court to rule that India has abused the court's procedures. <clears throat> Pakistan advances two main arguments to this end. First, it alleges that when requesting the indication of provisional measures on 8 May 2017, India failed to draw the court's attention to the existence of a constitutional right to lodge a clemency petition. Secondly, Pakistan submitted that before instituting proceedings on 8 May 2017, India had failed to give consideration to other dispute settlement mechanisms envisaged in Articles 2 and 3 of the optional protocol. The court observes in relation to Pakistan's first argument that in its order indicating provisional measures, it took into account the possible consequences for Mr. Jadavi's situation of the availability under Pakistani law of any appeal or petition procedure, including the clemency petition to which Pakistan refers in support of its claim. In this regard, the court concluded inter alia, and I quote, that there was considerable uncertainty as to when a decision on any appeal or petition could be rendered, and if the sentence is maintained, as to when Mr. Jadav could be executed, end of quote. Therefore, there is no basis to conclude that India abused its procedural rights when requesting the court to indicate provisional measures in this case. In relation to the second argument, the court notes that none of the provisions of the optional protocol relied on by Pakistan contain preconditions to the court's exercise of its jurisdiction. The court interpreted these provisions in the case concerning United States diplomatic and consular staff in Tehran, where it ruled that Articles 2 and 3 of the optional protocol to the Vienna Convention on diplomatic relations and to the Vienna Convention on consular relations do not lay down, and I quote, a precondition of the applicability of the precise and categorical provision contained in Article 1 establishing the compulsory jurisdiction of the court in respect of disputes arising out of the interpretation or application of the Vienna Convention in question. 
Articles 2 and 3 provide only that as a substitute for recourse to the court, the parties may agree upon resort either to arbitration or to conciliation. End of quote. It follows that India was under no obligation in the present case to consider other dispute settlement mechanisms prior to instituting proceedings before the court on 8 May 2017. Thus, Pakistan's objection based on the alleged non-compliance by India with Articles 2 and 3 of the Optional Protocol cannot be upheld. The Court recalls that only in exceptional circumstances should it reject a claim based on a va valid title of jurisdiction on the ground of abuse of process. In this regard, there has to be clear evidence that the applicant's conduct amounts to an abuse of process. The court does not consider that in the present case there are such exceptional circumstances that would warrant rejecting India's claims on the ground of abuse of process. Accordingly, the court finds that Pakistan's first objection to the admissibility of India's application must be rejected. With regard to the second objection to the admissibility of India's application, Pakistan requests the court to rule that India has abused various rights it has under international law. In its pleadings, Pakistan has based this objection on three main arguments. First, it refers to India's refusal to provide evidence of Mr. Jadavi's Indian nationality by means of his actual passport in his real name, even though it has a duty to do so. Secondly, Pakistan mentions India's failure to engage with its request for assistance in relation to the criminal investigations into Mr. Jadavi's activities. Thirdly, Pakistan alleges that India authorized Mr. Jadav to cross the Indian border with, I quote, a false cover name, authentic passport, end of quote, in order to conduct espionage and terrorist activities. In relation to these arguments, Pakistan invokes various counter-terrorism -ter obligations set out in Security Council Resolution 1373 of 2001. In its judgment on the preliminary objections in the case concerning immunities and criminal proceedings, the court ruled that abuse of rights cannot be invoked as a ground of inadmissibility when the establishment of the right in question is properly a matter for the merits. The court notes, however, that by raising the argument that India has not provided the court with the actual passport in Mr. Jadavi's real name, Pakistan appears to suggest that India has failed to prove Mr. Jadavi's nationality. This argument is relevant to the claims based on Article 36 of the Vienna Convention in relation to Mr. Jadav and therefore must be addressed at this stage. In this respect, the court observes that the evidence before it shows that both parties have considered Mr. Jadav to be an Indian national. Indeed, Pakistan has so described Mr. Jadav on various occasions, including 
in its letter of assistance for criminal investigation against the Indian national Kulbu, Shan Sudai Jadev, addressed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Pakistan on 23 January 2017 to the High Commission of India in Islamabad. Consequently, the court is satisfied that the evidence before it leaves no room for doubt that Mr. Yadav is of Indian nationality. As already indicated, the second and third argument is advanced by Pakistan in support of its second objection to the admissibility of the application are based on various alleged breaches of India's obligations under Security Council Resolution 1373 of 2001. In particular, Pakistan refers to India's failure to respond to Pakistan's request for mutual legal assistance with its criminal investigations into Mr. Jadavi's espionage and terrorism activities, as well as the issuance of what Pakistan <coughs> describes as, and I quote, a false cover name, authentic passport, End of quote. The court observes that, in essence, Pakistan seems to argue that India cannot request consular assistance with respect to Master Jadav, while at the same time it has violated other obligations under international law as a result of the aforementioned acts. While Pakistan has not clearly explained the link between these allegations and the rights invoked by India on the merits, it is the court's view that such allegations are properly a matter for the merits and therefore cannot be invoked as a ground of inadmissibility. For these reasons, the court finds that Pakistan's second objection to the admissibility of India's application must be rejected. The second and third arguments advanced by Pakistan will be addressed later when dealing with the merit. The court now turns to the third objection to the admissibility of India's application whereby Pakistan asks the court to dismiss the application on the basis of India's alleged unlawful conduct. Relying on the doctrine of clean hands and the principles of ex turbi causa non oritur axio and ex injuria jus non oritur, Pakistan contends that India has failed to respond to its request for assistance with the investigation into Mr. Jadavi's activities, that it has provided him with, I quote, a false cover name, authentic passport, end of quote, and more generally, that it is responsible for Mr. Jadavi's espionage and terrorism activities in Pakistan. The court does not consider that an objection based on the clean hand doctrine may by itself render an application based on a valid title of jurisdiction inadmissible. It recalls that in the case concerning certain Iranian assets, Islamic Republic of Iran versus United States of America, the court ruled that even if it were shown that the applicant's conduct was not beyond reproach, this would not be sufficient per se to uphold the objection to admissibility raised by the respondent on the basis of the clean hand doctrine. The court therefore concludes that Pakistan's objection based on the said doctrine must be rejected. The court further notice 
that Pakistan has relied on the judgment of the Permanent Court of International Justice in the factory at Chorso case in order to advance an argument based on a principle to which it refers as equis turbi causa non oritur axio. However, in that case, the Permanent Court referred to a principle, and I quote, generally accepted in the jurisprudence of international arbitration, as well as by municipal courts, that one party cannot avail himself of the fact that the other has not fulfilled some obligation. If the former party has, by some illegal act, prevented the latter from fulfilling the obligation in question, end of quote. With regard to this principle, the court is of the view that Pakistan has not explained how any of the wrongful acts allegedly committed by India may have prevented Pakistan from fully fulfilling its obligation in respect of the provision of consular assistance to Mr. Jadab. The court therefore finds that Pakistan's objection based on the principle of ex turbi causa non oritur axio cannot be upheld. This finding leads the court to a similar conclusion with regard to the principle of ex injuria jus non oritur, which stands for the proposition that unlawful conduct cannot modify the law applicable in the relations between the parties. In the view of the court, this principle is in opposite to the circumstances of the present case. Accordingly, the court finds that Pakistan's third objection to the admissibility of India's application must be rejected. In light of the foregoing, the court concludes that the three objections to the admissibility of the application raised by Pakistan must be rejected and that India's application is admissible. 